It was, in fact, the biggest tragedy to date in Brazil, not just in a circus, but in any public entertainment venue. Like living torches, children and adults ran, running over one another, in the desperate attempt to reach the narrow passage through which the entire huge crowd must flow. Many people fell and were trampled, causing the victims almost as many crushes as the burns. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Greetings and welcome to Frozen Time. I'm Catherine of Skye, and here we relate moments in history that shape the people around them, events which are often dark, disturbing, and tragic. So if that's what you're into, you're in the right place. Please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, it's time to cozy in for a tale that you won't soon forget. In 1961, we were in the middle of the Cold War. John F. Kennedy had just returned from a trip through Latin America. The fashion brand Yves Saint Laurent was founded in Paris. The film West Side Story is released. And aboard the Vostok 2, Soviet cosmonaut German Titov becomes the second human to orbit the Earth, and the first to be in outer space for more than one day. On the 17th of December of that year, a young girl named Maria José Pedroza, otherwise known as Zeze, like many other children, went with her parents to see the circus. Christmas week was beginning and the children had just begun their summer vacations. They were eager for a bit of fun and freedom from the rigors of school. The Gran Circus Norte Americano, Great North American, which was a sort of Brazilian version of the Ringling Brothers in North America, set up in Niteroi that week in the Praça Expedicionario in the city centre, right in front of a railway station across the bay from Rio de Janeiro. It was advertised as the most complete circus in Latin America, with approximately 60 performers, 20 other employees and 150 animals. It was operated by the Estevanovich Brothers of Brazil and employed performers from several countries. As the many children and their parents walked up, they would see the huge big top, the central tent of the circus rising against the sky. The circus owner Danilo Estevanovich had purchased a brand new tent from India, a large blue and white tent made of nylon and weighing six tons. Unknown to the owner, however, was that although the tent had been advertised as being made of nylon, it was actually made of cotton treated with paraffin wax, a highly flammable material. Yes, it's the same material that fuels candle flames. The circus goers filed into the tent, marveling at all the jugglers, animals, and colorful sights to be seen. Between 2,500 and 3,000 people, including about 1,400 children, entered the big top that day, filling the tent to capacity. The performances started featuring animals, clowns and acrobats, and the audience oohed and awed, children squealing with delight at all the joys of seeing the circus shows. At around 3.45 in the afternoon, the finale of the show started. It was the trapeze act and they were getting ready to perform their final grandiose stunt, the triple jump. One of the trapeze artists performing the stunt saw that a fire had started in the stands on the left side of the exit tunnel, and she was alarmed, but waited until her partner safely landed on the platform before alerting him. They both dived into the net below and then escaped the tent. As the crowd became aware of the fire, pandemonium ensued. Fear-crazed women and children rushed for the exits, fell atop each other, and caught fire. Within five minutes, the flames had enveloped the tent and seared the ropes, and the blazing mass fell onto the spectators. Some were trapped in their seats, others could not get near the exits, some were trampled to death. There was at least one report of a quick-thinking boy scout who used a pocket knife to slit open the walls of the tent to make another exit, doubtless saving lives. The magazine O Cruzeiro described the situation thus, and confusion engulfed the Grand Circus Norte Americano. In an instant, thousands of people, men, women, and children, tumbling, tried to gain the exit door. 
The warning had come late. The canvas, taken by fire, burned to its fullest extent, and shortly thereafter it collapsed into the crowd. Piercing screams were heard everywhere. Then silence, and death enveloped in a mountain of ash. The newspaper Tribuna di Imprensa added, in less than 20 minutes, the circus was completely destroyed, with a pile of charred bodies at the main door and others scattered on the chairs and under the bleachers. A little far from the circus, this was the spectacle, some crawling almost in front of the Leopoldina train station, others tearing their clothes on fire, screaming. Those who managed to get out unharmed screamed for help. Two minutes later, the fire department arrived, which had only one job, to gather the dead to the private trucks and send them to the morgue. There was practically no more fire. The fire station, luckily, was very close by, and the firefighters, as soon as they arrived, began to wrap blankets around the burning bodies. Everyone tried to pull victims out of the rubble, and even before the ambulances arrived, private cars took the wounded to get medical attention. A policeman on the scene noted, I've seen some horrible, horrible things, but I never thought I would see anything so horrible. Parents went from hospital to hospital searching for their missing children, and unattended children in the streets cried for their missing mothers. Niteroi hospitals radioed Rio de Janeiro for plasma, narcotics, and ice, but ambulances and other aid from Rio de Janeiro had to cross Guanajara Bay in ferry boats, which took half an hour for the trip. Late in the day, the Brazilian Air Force Hospital began to receive victims. The military provided physicians and rounded up nurses to care for all the wounded and dying. Federal troops were called upon to help transport bodies to the morgue and injured to the hospitals, and used military trucks because of the shortage of ambulances. Survivors of the fire generally were at first almost incoherent as they tried to describe the brief terror in the flaming tent. They said the exit seemed to have been blocked almost at once with bodies. O Cruzeiro sums up the sadness and devastation. Hundreds of men's, women's, and children's shoes scattered around the ring attested to the full drama of the tragedy that had hit the North American circus, among them a baby bottle that was no longer used by its owner. Most of the victims were miners who had gone in search of joy and fun the future, however, has a cruel fate in store for them. Death. Over 2,000 men and women lined up in front of the Niteroi morgue seeking their loved ones, some openly weeping. As the morgue became too crowded, some bodies were laid out in the city's sports stadium for relatives to identify. In the covered wing of the building, the charred bodies were lined up, covered with white cloths donated by people. Once they were recognized, they were placed into coffins immediately for burial. The stadium's central football field was transformed into what Fatos and Fotos called the biggest and saddest carpentry in the world. Workers set to the sad task of creating all different sized coffins for the needs of the deceased. The governor summoned all carpenters and woodworkers in Niteroi to make caskets urgently because they feared the bodies could cause a health hazard in the summer heat if they remained unburied. Many workers volunteered for the job. In just 24 hours, enough coffins of all sizes were ready. However, the ratio of the small children's caskets to those of adults caused much grief in the city. Many of the victims were scheduled to be buried in a mass funeral that Monday. All told, 372 died immediately, with the total reaching 503 dead as others succumbed to their injuries, most of them women and children. Most were either trampled or burned to death. About 70% of the victims were children, with many eyewitnesses raising claims that the children had been trampled to death by adults frantic to escape through the exits of the main tent. Three days of mourning were declared along with a state of calamity for the area. Brazilian President João Goulart inspected the scene of the fire and authorized federal aid for the victims. Monetarily, the circus manager estimated the owner's loss at around 50 million cruzeiros, about 125,000, 
or 1.16 million today. Circus owner Danilo Estevanovich said all the circus animals and performers escaped the fire because they had finished their performances in the main tent and were outside when the fire started. Culturally, the fire imprinted itself on generations of citizens, horrified at what they experienced and the sadness of everyone around them, many of whom had lost relatives and friends. Circus owner Danilo Estevanovich is quoted as saying that the flames, quote, enveloped the tent in 30 seconds, and he was convinced the fire was set deliberately, quote, because a short circuit or carelessly discarded cigarette could not cause such a quick spreading fire. And let us not forget that the tent was not made out of nylon, as the owner ordered, but instead made exactly like a candle, paraffin wax around a cotton core. If we want to look at the science a tiny bit, we see that nylon combusts at a higher temperature than wax or cotton, and thus the lower temperature combustible wax played a pivotal role in the speed of the fire spreading. There are several theories as to the cause of the fire. One theory is that being so near to the train tracks, it is possible that a spark from a passing train might have jumped onto the highly flammable tent canvas to set it alight. The second possibility, proposed by independent investigations and opinions, point to electrical problems that were covered up. However, investigations by the local authority noted that the setup looked a bit suspect, but ultimately it was found to have maintained its integrity. Another possibility is arson, and that is the most complicated possibility of all. First, it must be noted that the authorities noticed the precariousness of the electrical installations, the absence of fire extinguishers, the presence of dry grass in the circus areas, and the lack of exits, all of which contributed to the high loss of life in the fire that day. Three suspects were arrested in connection with the fire. The first two were employees of the Estevanovich family, who had previously threatened to burn down the Big Top Circus. And third was Adelson Marcelino Alves, known as Dequina, the 21-year-old single man who lived with his mother. Dequina was an ex-employee who was reprimanded several times on the job by his boss, but ultimately was fired when he promised to, quote, set fire to the circus. On the day of the fire, a circus employee saw Dequina at the side of the fire until he disappeared just as the flames appeared. He confessed to the crime with revenge as his motive. However, there was a note that draws attention, quote, The confession, according to Security Secretary Gouveia de Abreu, was made without coercion and assisted by a prosecutor. This, perhaps, is why some believe that the confession obtained at a military base, ostensibly to protect him from the fury of the public, might not have been the real truth, and why some are still searching for the real cause of the fire. In his confession, he said he had the help of Walter Rosa dos Santos, who threw gasoline on part of the canvas when he set it on fire. Walter and his lover, Regina Maria de Concaisa, were arrested and both denied their involvement. Dequina confirmed that he was the one who set the fire, throwing a lit match on the circus roof. He explained that he had done everything because he had fought with the circus porter, Pernambuco, and admitted he hadn't anticipated the consequences. He had not imagined that so many would die. The inquiry conducted by the police chief continued to confirm the confession of Adelson Marcelino Alves, including testimony from a lady who had heard Dequina say he was going to burn down the circus. During the judicial process, because Dequina had already been interned in a sanatorium before, a mental health examination was requested by the state prosecutor's office. The medical experts described Dequina as, quote, medium-grade oligophrenic, or in other words, have retarded mental development or, quote, a low mental level. His mother appeared in the pages of the magazine Manchete, saying, quote, My son is not a criminal. He has been a madman since he was little. But, despite admitting her son's madness, the mother left doubt in the air by saying that her son had always had a habit of blaming himself. Dequina was reported to have learning difficulties, having been expelled from a school group at the age of nine, and later ran away from the boarding school he attended at the age of 12. He sometimes went to a neighbor's house to ask for money. Other times he said, quote, I slept with pigs and chickens. At some point, his mother admitted that her son was a lot of work for her and the police, confessing to thefts. The magazine Cruzeiro noted that some police officers believed that Dequina would have accepted the crime for being a paranoid exhibitionist. 
The magazine also questioned whether the case was about, quote, the most inhumane of murderers or the most irresponsible mentally ill. Tequino repeated his story that Walter Rosa was involved, who in turn insisted that he was not in the circus at the time and presented his alibi. However, it was his wife who outed him, at which point he tried to rebut her statement saying that she was, quote, a drunkard and therefore did not know what she was saying. Walter also refused to admit that he had bought gasoline, as he was accused, even though the governor claimed to have met the gas seller, to which Walter Rosa replied, quote, that man does not exist. Later, after being taken to the political and social order police to testify, it was announced that Walter Rosa had confessed to his participation in the fire. In one newspaper, it was said that the confession had not convinced several police officers, Prosecutor Paolo Galindo also appeared in the press saying there were contradictions in the testimonies of Dequina and Walter Rosa's wife. During the testimonies, José dos Santos, called Pardal, would also be accused as an accomplice by Dequina. Pardal, like Walter Rosa, ended up admitting his involvement as well as that of his wife, Dirce Siquera de Asís. Pardal was serving a sentence in the Casa de Detensao and that Sunday was on authorized freedom. As reported in the Tribuna de Imprensa, a photo of Adelson Marcelino Alves showed his arm with a caption stating that the day after the fire, Dequina went to Rio de Janeiro to donate blood to the victims of the fire. Fotos and photos placed in the headline the question about the accused, crazy or murderer? The same magazine accompanied Manchetti's coverage by showing a photo with captions attesting that the same Dequina had buried victims of the tragedy. It's interesting that Dequina was recorded by the press both giving blood and helping bury the dead. Since he was declared to be of, quote, low mental health level by the expert physician testimony, it's unlikely he would have had the cunning to hide in plain sight. I think it's far more likely that he felt genuine grief and was supporting his community just like everyone else around him. Of course, these emotions could be authentic whether he was culpable and regretted his actions and wanted to repay the community in the best way he knew how, or his confession might have been coerced. Just imagine the prosecuting attorney, quote, assisting this man of limited mental acuity, much less military interrogators. In any case, the sentence was issued by the judge of the first criminal court of Niteroi, Jovino Macado Jordao, on October 23, 1962 based on the evidence gathered. The judge noted that, quote, it is impossible not to be infected by the climate of horror. His analysis led him to conclude, quote, I can say from what I saw, felt, studied, verified, and concluded that the fire in the Grand Circus Norte de Americano was criminal. In the end, he confirmed that, quote, Adelson Marcellino Alves was the main author of the facts and that he set fire to the canvas with his own hands having been assisted by Walter Rosa dos Santos, who, quote, bought the gasoline, throwing it against the circus roof, and Jose dos Santos, who remained, quote, watching the place to ensure success to the material authors. Result, Adelson Marcelino Alves, known as Dequina, was sentenced to 16 years in prison with six years of internment in a judicial asylum as a security measure. Walter Rosa dos Santos was sentenced to 16 years, José dos Santos was sentenced to 14 years in prison with a period foreseen in an agricultural colony, also for security reasons. The two women would be acquitted by the sentence for not being an effective contribution to the commission of the crime. But the judge's sentence notes, quote, Monsters of insensitivity. They will deserve our contempt for the lack of any human warmth and emotion. Zeze herself was badly wounded that day, burned on 90% of her body with third-degree burns. She spent 20 days in a coma and eight months hospitalized and underwent five surgeries to repair various parts of her body. The scars on her skin were her enemies for many years, both physically and mentally. But in spite of this, she eventually grew up to become a teacher, wife, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and author of books, including her biography, Lives on Fire. There are two chapters which narrate the moments she was inside the circus tent while it was burning. Quote, With far thought, I reached the year of 1961. Exactly on the 17th of December, 
when the heat was almost 40 degrees and the distraction was general, me sitting in the stands applauding the show, that was interrupted by the scream. Fire! It was the burning nylon and paraffin canvas of the great North American circus in flames. Even today I relive that horrible moment, the crowd running in one direction and falling on top of each other who were trampled on the trail of the last scene. And also I was there, but I survived to tell my story of overcoming, and I couldn't even forget the day that transformed my life, uh, my life and my appearance. Burning Lives details all my suffering, but it also talks about how I got around and conquered everything they said I would never get. It's not hard to be happy. Just accept yourself, she explained. There were stories of luck, courage, and desperation. In one turn of good fortune, an elephant that was getting ready to be brought on stage, once seeing the fire, panicked and ran, dragging part of the canvas away, thus saving a large number of spectators. One man got out of the tent with all five of his children by ducking under the stands instead of trying to escape through the desperate crush. A man, owner of a bar, destroyed his commercial establishment when he went mad at the fact of the loss of his wife and children. Another man went mad accusing the neighbor of having taken her children to the circus. So, what do you think? The confessions of the accused were only obtained after each of them was being held by the military, and the prime suspect was mentally disabled. Should we believe those confessions, or were they coerced? I want to know what you think. That's the end of our history today. If you got something out of today's episode, please subscribe to the channel, click the bell, and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. If you enjoyed this video, please activate the like button and consider leaving a comment. Both help us grow the channel so we can offer you more histories in this format. If you want to get in touch with me, write to me at the email on the about page or ping me on Discord. And remember to subscribe to our social media channels on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. If you're consuming this episode as a podcast, we'd be very thankful if you left a review since that raises our ratings on the podcast sites and helps people find us. As always, much love to our patrons.